My presentation today is going to be on job polarization and rising inequality in the region. So job polarization is a trend that's been reshaping the labor market for the past three decades. And by job polarization, we're really referring to two different dimensions. Uh, one, a shrinking middle, that there's been a growing number of both high-skilled and low-skilled jobs in the economy, uh, but a declining number of job opportunities for those in the middle. Uh, the second dimension is that there's been a widening gap in wages. Uh, particularly, we've seen wages increase for high-skill, high-wage workers, while middle and low-skill workers have seen little, if any, change in their wages at all. Um, and these two trends have been leading to rising inequality, both in the nation and in the region. Um, and what I'll show is that, in fact, it's led to a sharper than average rise in inequality uh, in downstate New York and northern New Jersey. So there are three things that I'm going to do in today's presentation. Uh, first, discuss why job polarization has been occurring. Uh, second, look at what job polarization looks like, both in the nation and in the region. And then talk about some of the challenges that it's creating for workers and discuss what can be done to help workers adapt to these changes. So first, let me talk a little bit about why uh, job polarization has been occurring. Uh, probably the most significant reason is technology. So technology has displaced many of what we often think of as uh, uh, middle skill jobs, particularly those that involve routine tasks. So uh, these are jobs that most easily can be automated um, and uh, in manufacturing, for example. Um, now it takes far fewer workers to produce goods and services than it did in the past, with computers and different forms of technology integrated into the production process from start to finish. Um, another example is administrative support. So while in the past, uh, one administrative support person may have been able to support, say, one or two managers, now uh, an administrative support person can support an entire floor of managers and other decision makers uh, because of computers and technology and software available for office work. Um, so at the same time, technology has also increased the demand for high-skill workers. So these are particularly those who create and utilize technology to be more productive. And because of that, it's pushed up their wages faster than the rest of the pack. So um, for example, um, you, know, you can think of software engineers, those are developing technology, uh, but also, say, financial analysts or managers who can now uh, process vast amounts of information um, to make uh, their jobs more productive. Now, at the low end of the skill spectrum, many low-skilled jobs have actually been protected from this force. And that's because a person is still required. So machines can't yet do things like take care of children and fold towels and, and uh, you know, maintain buildings and do construction work. At least at this point, uh, technology has actually um, not been able to displace many jobs as, and what I'll show at the low end of the skill spectrum. Uh, a second main cause of job polarization is globalization. So similar to technology, uh, low-cost workers from overseas have tended to displace workers in the middle skill uh, category. Um, these are the ones that are most, these are the workers that are most likely to face competition from overseas. While at the high end of the spectrum and the low end of the spectrum, these are many jobs that have been protected uh, from this force because it still requires uh, a person with face-to-face -face contact or physical proximity. So you can think of things like flight attendants, uh, food service workers, uh, farm hands, people that are picking vegetables. These are all things that need to be done uh, in, in a physical location, uh, and globalization can't really displace those jobs very well. So a third uh, uh, feature about uh, uh, a cause behind job polarization has to do with why wages are rising faster at, at the top end. Um, and here, one of the main reasons is that the supply of college graduates has not kept, kept pace with demand. So demand and supply have both been rising, but uh, if you look at the numbers of demand, has actually been rising faster than the supply, and that's actually pushed up wages for college graduates faster than wages for, uh, for the rest of the pack. So that's put a premium on college degrees and resulted in more pulling apart of wages uh, from top to bottom. So what I'm going to do next is look at some of these job polarization trends for the nation and the region. Um, and we're going to do this using data from the census between 1980 and 2010. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take every worker uh, and map them into one of 25 different occupations. These are going to be occupations that are consistently defined over this entire period. And then we're going to group these occupations into four skill categories. And we're going to do this uh, using their wage as an, an approximation for their skill level. So uh, starting with the high skill group, 
Uh, these are jobs that uh, in, in 2010, uh, occupations that tended to pay uh, above uh, about $50,000 a year. Um, and these are a lot of jobs that require thinking, a lot, they're, they're, they're cognitive, they require problem solving. Um, so in here we have things like physicians, attorneys, scientists, researchers, um, finance managers, things, uh, th things of that sort. And this is about a quarter of the workforce right now. At the other end of the spectrum, we have jobs that uh, tended to pay, on average, $20,000 or less per year. Um, uh, these low-skilled jobs uh, include basically many jobs that are not subject to these forces of technology and globalization. So they're somewhat protected. So we've got healthcare supports. We've got like nurses' aides, um, uh, building maintenance people that are maintaining buildings, uh, doing working in farming, personal care, food services, uh, uh, you know, uh, child care workers, and the like. And then we've taken the middle and split them into two categories, an upper middle and a lower middle. So the upper middle group is kind of a mix. It includes some of these jobs that are protected from technology and globalization. So you've got, uh, uh, we've got uh, police and firefighters, uh, teachers, um, construction workers. But we've also got one segment of, the, of people that are typically uh, employed in manufacturing called precision production. So these are essentially higher skilled manufacturing workers. These jobs all pay between thirty and forty thousand dollars a year in terms of their median. So this is a group that's kind of got a mix of both. Um, that's about twenty percent of the workforce, and by far the largest segment of the workforce is employed in this lower middle group. Uh, that's almost forty percent of the workforce, um, and it includes two uh, two um, jobs that are highly subject to these forces of technology and globalization: administrative support uh, and machine operators, which are essentially lower skilled manufacturing workers. Um, so what I'm going to do next is look at job growth in these categories uh, between 1980 and 2010. Um, so here um, we see sort of a clear U-shaped pattern. So the highest growth has been both at the high skill and the low skill ends of the spectrum, while the slowest, slowest growth has been in the middle, uh, but this lower middle has seen particularly slow growth. And what's happened is because growth has been pulled apart at the top and the bottom ends, it's changed the distribution of where workers work over time. Um, so what I'll, what I'll do in this uh, next slide is look at the share of jobs in each of these skill categories, both in 1980 and 2010, to see you know, where the different jobs are that people are working in. So in 1980, we had about 19% of the workforce in high-skilled jobs, about 13% in low-skilled jobs. By 2010, that low skill share had grown from 13 to 16 percent, and the high skill share grew from 19 to 25 percent. And the middle, of course, has shrunk. Um, the upper middle has stayed basically the same at about 20 percent, but clearly that the biggest decline has been this lower middle skill group. So there, almost half of the workforce were in these lower middle skill jobs in 1980, uh, but uh, now it's 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 declined a full 10 percentage points, uh, and it's down to about 30 38 percent. So what I'm going to do next is look at some of these job polarization trends for the region. And I'm going to look at four different parts of the region. We're going to look at upstate New York as an aggregate, downstate New York, uh, northern New Jersey, and then we'll look at Puerto Rico. And I'm going to first look at uh, the job growth in each of these categories uh, like we did for the US. Um, so let me start with uh, upstate, downstate, northern New Jersey. So here are the three. Now, the first thing that you might notice is that these all have like the US, they all have a U-shaped pattern. So they're, they're showing that in the region, the same thing's been happening. Most of the growth's been at the high end and the low end of the skill spectrum. But there are a few differences that I want to point out. Uh, first, uh, the lower middle group has actually seen an outright decline in employment in the region. Um, so there are a couple reasons why that group has been sort of hit harder uh, in the region compared to the nation. So one is the people working in manufacturing jobs. We've had a steeper decline in manufacturing jobs. That's true both upstate, downstate, and in northern New Jersey. Um, so you can think of things that happen like an upstate, the loss of the steel industry, say in Buffalo. Um, but we've also got, even in New York City, a uh, steep loss in manufacturing jobs, say, in the apparel industry. So our, our manufacturing jobs were, were hit uh, particularly hard. Uh, another difference is that um, in downstate in northern New Jersey, administrative support jobs were hit particularly hard. So we had actually a higher concentration of people working in those jobs in the region earlier on. Uh, they were hit harder. Um, we had more people working in that sector, probably for a couple of reasons. One, corporate headquarters that are located downstate uh, in New York City, northern New Jersey, um, but also uh, the financial services in industry, which is an intensive user of administrative support. Now, you know, that, that, that uh, people are able to process data and information much more, much more efficiently using less workers, so that might be another reason why we've seen a steeper decline there. 
Another difference that I want to point out is that in downstate and in northern New Jersey, the group that saw the biggest gain was actually low-skill jobs. It was bigger, a bigger gain than high-skill jobs. Uh, so there are a couple reasons why that group grew more rapidly in the region. Um, one is that there was more growth in lower-skilled healthcare jobs. So these would be like nurses, aides, and the like. Um, so that, that grew a little bit more rapidly. And personal services and food service jobs, those grew more rapidly downstate, probably for a couple of reasons. One, the tourism industry, um, especially in New York City, uh, but also the higher wealth that people have in, in, in downstate northern New Jersey, as I'll show, especially in high-wage high workforce. That's probably supported more of these types of jobs in the region. Uh, in terms of Puerto Rico, the picture is, is actually quite a bit different. There is, you know, the one similarity is that the group with the slowest gain well, was this lower middle group. Uh, but Puerto Rico, in many ways, is very different. But I, I do want to point out that they had a significant growth in high skilled jobs, um, uh, uh, and, uh, but they didn't have as, as significant a growth in low skilled jobs. Um, so there, uh, there, there, there was less growth, particularly in uh, healthcare support jobs uh, in Puerto Rico than in the US. So um, in addition to sort of jobs polarizing into the upper and lower ends, there's also been a polarizing effect that we've seen in terms of wages. So I'm just going to illustrate this for the US, but it's pretty similar for the region as well. What I've done here is plot, plotted uh, in, in inflation-adjusted dollars the real wage uh, for each of these skill groups over time. Um, and clearly, you can see the high school group has seen a steady increase in wages throughout this entire period, whereas the other groups have seen little, if any, increase at all. In fact, that upper middle group has seen zero growth over a 30-year period. Um, and the lower middle and low school groups have seen a little bit of growth, uh, but you know, not so much over the 2000s. So this has resulted in, in, a, in, a, in a pulling apart uh, of wages between the top and the bottom. So um, these two trends. Um, more people working in the high end and low end, coupled with wage gains that have been concentrated at the high end, while the rest has seen uh, uh, less growth, uh, have contributed to, to rising inequality uh, in the nation and in the region. So what I'm going to do is illustrate that using an index of, of, uh, of wage inequality called Gini coefficient, if you're familiar with that term. But it's basically just an index. Higher values mean more inequality. Uh, so this is the index for the U.S. as a whole. So there's been a, a clear rise in inequality over the period. Uh, downstate and in northern New Jersey, there's actually been a sharper, uh, the, the increase has been sharper than for the U.S., and that occurred especially in the 1990s. So it's, it's, it's been, it was a sharper increase, and there's more inequality uh, in downstate and northern New Jersey. And that's probably due to do, do a couple of things. One is that wage growth at the upper end uh, was actually even higher, as, as one might expect, uh, downstate than in the U.S. And there was more growth in people working at the low end. So that sort of uh, resulted in a more inequality. Uh, for upstate New York, there was still an increase in inequality, but it wasn't quite as significant. In fact, inequality remains below the U.S. Uh, there's a couple reasons why there. I mean, there wasn't as significant growth in low-skilled jobs, um, but also wages at the low end actually increased a little more upstate relative even to the U.S., so there was a little bit more uh, equal um, growth in wages there than, uh, than, than the rest of the district. When you want to look at inequality uh, relative to Puerto Rico, we actually have to put this on a different scale. In part, you know, Puerto Rico is such a different type of economy, and there's much more inequality. And, and so you can see that the level of inequality rose much more significantly. Um, this is in part because they, Puerto Rico did have that growth in high-wage jobs, high-skilled jobs. Uh, but also, there's just a lot of people working in low-skill, low-paying jobs in Puerto Rico, you know, much more than uh, you would see, say, for example, in the U.S. So there's just much more inequality going on there uh, th than you might expect uh, relative to the U.S. So um, just to summarize what the key trends are in the region, uh, first, there's been a shrinking in middle-skill jobs in the region, especially in this lower middle-skill category. Those jobs were particularly hard hit uh, in the region. Um, there's been growth in high-skill jobs and low-skill jobs in and around New York City. There's been more growth in those low-skill jobs than nationally. Uh, across the board, wage growth has been concentrated in high-skill jobs. Uh, and these trends have resulted in rising inequality across the region, across the country, but particularly in and around New York City. So um, in thinking about sort of the implications, um, these polarization trends have created significant challenges for the workforce as it adapts to these changes. So the pathway to sort of a traditional middle class type job uh, that we may have thought of uh, maybe even just a decade or two ago uh, is changing. And, and skills uh, are, are increasingly important. Um, so uh, 
uh, it's increasingly difficult because these jobs are being polarized into the upper and lower ends. So people may be driven into lower skilled jobs if their skills can adapt to sort of the up the the, the higher requirements that uh, jobs are are, are requiring. Um, so workers increasingly need a higher degree of knowledge and skills if they don't want to be left behind. So what can they do? Um, well, I think what we're pointing out is that skill development is more important now than it's ever been before for workers. Um, so that means making choices about how much education to uh, acquire, what types of skills you're, uh, and training one is going to get, um, what types of, say, majors one is going to choose. Uh, these are all important decisions, perhaps more important than ever before. So we're trying to uh, suggest that uh, making these decisions early and wiser are going to have implications for people throughout their entire working lives. Uh, and we're also pointing out that uh, workers should be prepared to continually upgrade their skills. So it's not the case that one can simply uh, get a job based on their skills and sort of stay in that job um, uh, for, for their working lives. Um, workers need to be prepared to continually upgrade their skills through gaining more work experience, through doing on-the-job training, through doing off-the-job training, through uh, working on getting uh, more education. Uh, these are sort of the way jobs are, are moving uh, as we uh, move ahead into this world of, of more polarization. Um, so I, I think what we're also pointing out here is that education policy can help. And there's a few things that we want to mention here. Uh, first, it, linkages between employers and educational institutions are important so that employers can communicate their needs, um, not just to workers, but also to the institutions that are training workers to help them get the skills that they're going to need. So collaboration is more important than ever between employers and these, these training institutions uh, so that workers can be prepared to take the jobs that are available and get the skills that are necessary. Um, as far as uh, education institutions, it's important to uh, think about uh, expanding the array of opportunities that are available. So traditional four-year degrees and graduate degrees are extremely important and valuable for the workforce, but there are a wider array, array of programs that may be helpful, especially for those who may not be on that uh, traditional college, four-year college degree path. One-year programs, two-year programs, three-year programs, anything in between to help workers train for those jobs that are available. And again, it, it, having employers participate in that process uh, is, is, uh, can be very helpful. And then finally, for those that are getting traditional college degrees uh, of any sort, uh, improving access to those degrees can really help workers take advantage of uh, the opportunities that are increasingly uh, available as we move forward.